Hi right, guys, this is the loon for deucescrack.com. We're making a mentor series video and I'm here with Krantz. What's up everybody? So, so I will be playing four tables of six max one two and Krantz will be coaching me. Yep, I haven't actually coached anyone at one two in a while, so I'm kind of curious as to how the games play. I haven't I haven't really actually coached anyone on micro gaming either, so I mean I have my uh my theories about how the games might be. I'm sure they're a lot more aggressive now than they used to be, but I'm definitely curious to see um how difficult they are. I think they're still uh, beatable, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some guys that, yeah, there, there are some decent regulars on these stakes nowadays. So. Could be interesting. So do you know any of these players at the table? Uh, yeah, I know Mr. T. He is uh, grinding all day long. So um, He's pretty nitty, but I'm pretty sure he's in a rake race and it's three different players on one account. So I'm not. Uh, I don't make notes on him because he will play differently every time. Gotcha. And I know this Como 54 guy that's on table two and table three, and also table four. He's a heads-up player normally. So I expect him to make some pretty decent reads, but perhaps he makes some. He will make some mistakes uh, pre-flop. And I think that's. Yeah, I don't know any others here, so. That's okay. It. Uh, so then the uh, the stats you have on the other guys are those mainly data mine stats. Yeah, I've been data mining uh, the last half hour. Okay. Should be from there. Okay, cool. So that could be helpful. Yes. Yeah. Tables were pretty soft when I uh, sat down, but now at least table two here, top right gets a bit tougher. Yeah, we got a lot of red numbers. The green. I'm looking around trying to see all the green spots. It looks like table four is is the best one. Yes. Yeah. This guy is loose passive Corleone, and the short stack that's now in the big blind is also pretty loose passive for the most part. Um. Well, this table on top left gets uh, short handed, and that should be interesting with uh, the nitty kind of players here. Right, we can we can be get really aggressive. What are your typical stats? Are, uh, how how are you typically playing? What's your style like? In a six max game, uh, when I play four tables, I play around twenty two twenty or twenty one uh, tw twenty three twenty one. Um, and I'm also working on my aggression factors, but uh, for the most part, they're pretty high. Uh, here I see that on table 4 against this guy. I think he can peel the flop with some hands that I beat, but I don't see a lot of value in two barrels there, so I'm just going to check now. Okay. He's, I mean, that's a, re a really interesting situation because he's really, really uh, loose and uh, it's a good value bet on the river. Uh, the question becomes, you know, whether or not you go for taking his entire stack by betting the turn or if you check the river and, and try to get more value on the river river and also control the pot a little bit um, I'd I'd lean towards uh, trying to go f go for the whole stack just because he's a short stack but uh, one of the one of the important questions you always have to ask yourself in a situation like that is what your bet looks like to him some guys against like let's say the guy just calls all the time and you know that. Then betting is obviously superior because your hand is ahead of his calling range pre-flop and on the flop. And he can have an 8, he can have a 3, he can have a flush draw. There are all sorts of things that he can have. He can also have any king as well. But if you're up against a kind of loose guy who like is more likely to call you on the turn or less likely to call you on the turn than he is if you check back and bet the river, then a river value bet is really good. All right. Uh, well, he did have ace eight there. Right. So we, pro we in hindsight, we Just probably could have gotten um, his all of it. But the thing, the thing is, maybe not. I mean, we don't know. We haven't played enough of them yet. Maybe he would have just decided ace eight was no good on the turn. But when you check back, he thinks that it is good. He doesn't believe you. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's uh, what do you think? If we bet, if we bet the turn there, how big should we make it? it? The pot was around 25, and he had 45 left. If I, uh, I would probably bet the same thing with any hand that I'm betting with, and I bet like two thirds pot with that sack size. You you basically want to put some question a question in his head where it's not just call or fold where he thinks that you might fold it because you might be bluffing if he's got a hand like ace eight put him in that that decision where he said he thinks to himself well my hand could be good because he didn't go all in so i'll raise and maybe he'll fold you know maybe he's bluffing okay Yeah, so some uh you know, some other things we we just wanna be looking at or I'd say some things that and as there we go. I mean I was just gonna say that you're one step ahead of me. It's just taking notes on everyone. If if you notice that something in a in a hand you, you're not involved with, just make a note, especially when you're multi tabling. Um because that can be really helpful in helping you define the profile of of one of the players. Yeah, notes are very important. I think a lot of people don't make notes if they are uh, playing more than five or six tables, but notes are even more important, I think, if you play more tables. So. Right, absolutely. Uh, here with the Kings, I'm just going to continue on the Ace. Uh, I think it will still call with a lot of hands because he expects me to uh, continue with all my bluffs when the ace comes, especially because I know he's an Nets out player. Ah, so absolutely, absolutely, that's a a good reason to bet. Only now I, yeah, this raise small. In this particular situation, I mean, I would put him on. Generally saying, speaking, a set if you're beat or ace x, but uh, you know, it depends how widely he's calling out of the big blind. If we can include all those suited aces, it's, it's it's definitely possible that he has a hand like that, or that since he is a heads up player, he peeled the flop with a hand like I don't know, ace five of hearts, and decided to check raise the turn. Although I, I would, I think if you're bet at this, if you're beat at this point, sorry, it's by a slow played set. Um, mm -hmm. Or two pair rather than just a single ace. So I I would probably call and fold the river in this spot because when yeah. you call, if he is semi bluffing or just uh you know trying to take the pot down, he won't follow through because you can very easily have um, ace king here. Yeah, that's true. So on the river, I'd, I'd now fold. And also, I don't expect him to uh, like you said with hands like ace five. I don't expect him to check raise the turn because. Right, he wants you to continue, especially a yeah. heavy player, he wants you to continue bluffing if you are. Um, so really, the, I mean, the only hand that makes sense from there is, uh, and he's not loose enough for him to have, it's, this isn't like a heads-up match, and a heads-up match it would be a little different, but he's not loose enough to like really, uh, or expect him to like check call the flop with a, a gut shot straight draw, and then decide to check raise it on the turn and follow through on the river. Um, and one of the one of the most important things there is like the concept. A lot of people talk about how can you call the turn if you're gonna call if you're not gonna call the river. It's because you get a lot more information on the river. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, you could be bluffing the turn. It's very conceivable. I'd be firing 100% of my range for the most part on that turn. My value betting range and my bluffing range. That doesn't mean I'd follow through on the river, but you know, if I was bluffing the turn, I'd have to fold to his check raise. When I do call, it looks to him like I have a big hand, like you have a big hand. Uh, here I'm going to fold my dance with a 3-bet in front of me. Yeah, and he's he's tight too. Over, well, not over a lot of hands, but uh, he made a big 3-bet. Uh, what, what, uh, what hands would you typically be 4-betting? I mean, I couldn't consider, I wouldn't consider calling because he only has $100, but uh, what hands would you call or four bet there? Uh, I might call with something like jacks uh, because I think I can see a flop with that hand and play it then. Mm -hmm. And I think I would uh, four bet with queens uh, plus and ace king plus or right. ace king of course. Yeah. So what do you jacks. think about jacks? Go ahead. What do you think about jacks? Oh, well, I was just gonna say, um, 
Jax is a, a tricky situation. Jax, I would probably four bet. I probably ne- wouldn't have a cold calling hand because I think his range is, is going to be pretty tight there, and he's only got a hundred dollars. Um, so I'd probably just four bet and get it in rather than, you know, Jax. I guess you could wait for a non ace or king flop and then check check call or check raise all in. Um, mm-hmm. I I don't see myself getting away from it with his stack size at all, but uh, it becomes an interesting question when you have a hundred big blind stack. Um, you know. And you've got a slightly more aggressive player. How do you play tens? How do you play jacks? Uh, it just depends a lot on how often. This is weird. He check all the flop and led the turn. Yeah, I want to raise here. I think he's pretty weak. And, well, he's very aggressive so far on the turn, so I'm just gonna raise here. I, I like it. You can't really have a two. You could have no, a of course. Yeah, that's true. And I think the the two is a pretty good card for me mm-hmm. because it makes a set less likely for him so but I'd I, probably I beat with ace high <laughs> I don't necessarily think he has a 2 just because he went all in but it's good to know that he bet 3 bet all in with a lead it'll help you in the future if he does lead in a spot like that I'll make a note See, I like raising versus calling in that spot because it's conceivable that he would bet fold a hand like sevens or six five or uh you know, where where you have a lot more credibility, uh you're repping a lot more strength than you are by calling. And also, you know, if you do call you've you've lent him the initiative in the hand now and he he can do whatever he wants in the river. And there are a lot of rivers like if he's you know, there are a lot of rivers where that he can he can bluff you or improve and you know, with ace high, you're generally going to be. If you did call a turn, uh, you'd be checking back because you've got showdown value. And he, you know, if he improves, he may or may not value bet. So a lot of times, you're just letting him uh, dictate the pace of the hand, which isn't really a good thing. This guy here on table two, um, he doesn't fall to c bets a lot, and I think. He kind of likes to float, so if he calls here, I'm probably going to check the turn. And give him a chance to take a step there. Uh, I wouldn't check this turn. No, that's I, true. I might I might check any other turn, but that one just improves his hand so often that mm-hmm. he'll he's very likely to just check back with a, a happy that he has showdown value with an yeah. hand. I think so, yeah. You know, because he could peel you with 10 queen, with jack queen, all sorts of hands that now have gut shots and straight draws, or maybe even two pair with jack 10 that will happily check back to the river. Um, and also, if you look at it from a more holistic view in terms of overall game plan, when you do try to check raise that turn against all but the craziest players, that looks just, uh, when you do get that check raise off, your hand looks incredibly strong. Um, he re-raised you, or you re-raised him here? What happened? Uh, hard to please raised. I three bet the cold calls. Cold calls. Okay, so yeah, I would typically bet this. Um, you know, I don't necessarily know what to make of his cold call yet, so I would just stick with betting. <laughs> uh. You know, if I if I thought that his cold call means like premium range and that he would fold to the flop bet, mm-hmm. then I check back. But I have no reason to believe that. Um, the good thing about debating the merits of checking back there is that you have the board so crushed uh, that you can't yeah. afford to give free cards. And that the same thing goes for if you've got a a hand that doesn't even have a flush run. If you've got just top pair, you can check back. And it, it but it, to different people it means different things. You know. Against a, a light three better, a board like that, if I cold called with jacks, I might say that board is really, really safe because this guy three bets really light and he's only betting uh, his huge hands on the, on the flop. So on a dry board with an ace, it's not that dangerous. But to other people, they see the ace and they think, oh, God, I'm going to fold now. And they see the mm-hmm. they see like the three, four, five board is much more appealing. So here with a 10-7 suited, he's been raising my big blind, I think, for the third time in a row now. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking about 3-betting, but I think my hand is pretty decent, so I could call here. 
Yeah, I generally like to call, especially in blind versus blind situations like this against like an aggressive player in the small blind, at least in the games that I play in and in the mid six games that I've watched and coached and played in for videos, I found that people get really out of line if they're in the small blind, they're aggressive and they get re raised by the big blind. So whereas that that re raise would be amazing amazing play like a year ago, two years ago, because you get called and fold so much. Now people have just expanded their four betting range, they're bluffing, they're not giving up on pots as easily as they used to. So I, I would be betting this also. And I'd be betting because um, you bet last time and he check folded. In this case, even if you check calls, your hand is pretty well disguised. Um, so if you did improve, you could potentially win a big pot. I wouldn't barrel. I'd just bet once for value uh, You know, to okay. protect your hand and then check and try and see what happens in the river. Uh, All right. Yeah, he may also have a hand like 6-7 and try to... Uh, okay, so he bets 17 now in 32. He, I mean, he almost definitely has a better hand than you. He could have called you sure. on the flop. Uh, you can't raise but is there, if you're not repping. Is there, yeah. Okay, that's the problem. Okay. Yeah, you're you're not repping anything. Now, it would be different if, like, I don't know, let's say it was, it was like ace, seven, eight, two clubs. The turn was a blank and the river was like the king of clubs. Then you could theoretically rep a flush there. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of that depends on image. The thing is, when... The way, at least, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure if, if 200 no limit plays like this, but I assume it would against p players like Como, who's like 26, mm -hmm. 22, thinking tag. Um, I don't think they're, when their hand is face up, I don't think they're they're prone to make lots of folds. No, that's true. Um, and also, again, uh, because he's an head top player, mostly, I think, uh, he will realize what I'm representing. Right. And, Right, and it's yeah, like, it generally kind of speaking, if you can only represent uh, a very small range of hands and your opponent's hand is face up, and they know it is, they're not going to be finding folds in the games that you that, that we play in lately. Mm -hmm. So do we have stats on this guy, Vibla? Yeah, some, over 128 hands. 128, and he plays 2013 with a very small three bet. All right, so we we would fold this, and you know, yeah, I'd only be calling fives if we're deeper. I'd probably be folding against most players, four betting against the crazy three betters some of the time, and calling against most players if we're deeper. Um, you know, for our, for the most people who will be watching this video, it's like definitely an, an important concept. You know, pocket fives is is. Yeah, it's a cool looking hand. It's great when you flop a five, but people re raise lighter than just aces and kings these days. You can't call trying to hit a set. You just don't have the implied odds to do that. You get yourself in a lot of trouble when you convince yourself that uh, they've just got ace king. You know, it's a, that's the a old the old line of thought. I put you on ace king. I mean, I bu I busted out of a tournament in the World Series this summer because somebody put me on ace king. I had ace queen, but not ace king. But it was the same. It was the same kind of idea. They like to close their eyes and put you on the one hand that they beat, and, and we do that too because we 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 get attached to the value of our hand preflop. Um, so that you really want to give yourself as many options as possible. If you're deeper, yeah, you can play just for implied implied odds at the same time. But at the same time, now you've also got the ability to represent. A wider range of hands post flop against a wider three betting range. So with pocket fives, you're not just all when you're deeper at least, you're not always relying on just the value of hitting a five. You're you should be thinking about how and why you could turn it into a bluff and if that's gonna be effective. But at the same time I want to just hammer home that uh you know like I, I I just said, the if you're repping a very narrow range of hands against somebody who knows how to read hands, somebody who knows that their hand is face up, bluff's not going to work as often. And now you might say, okay, well if everyone's watching this video and they're not bluffing that often, shouldn't I be folding my hand more often? And yeah, maybe if if that starts to become the trend, then uh, the trend changes to people bluffing more, and it goes back and it's cyclical. Uh, but right now, bluffs just don't work as often unless they're very, very creative and well-timed. Mm 
funny you mentioned the Ace King story. I find it uh, that a lot of live players still think you always got Ace King if you three bet pre flop. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Absolutely. Any any chance that they have to find a reason for calling. Yeah, so if you got Ace King, I three bet your hand is face up against them. <laughs> at least, at least they will always guess right. So. Yeah, I mean that's a good thing when you three bet and then the flop comes Ace or King high, and you don't have Ace King. It's good for you if you're bluffing, but mm -hmm. uh, if you're trying to rep aces, <laughs> that's another story. So, so far, um, I've been playing a little bit looser than normally. Also because I play more tables uh, mm -hmm. normally. So, uh, And also, the big blinds are pretty tight when I'm in a small blind. And I've been attacking them. And this guy on table 3, rush game, just played back at me and I had to fold. But on table 1 and 2, it's I've been stealing the blinds from Oli and Mr. T a lot. So, that made me some money at least. Here against uh, Oli, I just make it uh, 3x because I'm just want to be raising my entire range there, just 100% of the time. Right, so I make it a bit smaller. And against Mr. T here, I make it 6 or 7. Also because he's pretty tight. And against other uh, players, when I can't raise uh, my junk hands, I would probably make it 4x because I'm out of position and blind versus blind, I just want to make it a bit bigger than normal. It makes sense. Um, you know, it also makes it more costly for them to 3-bet you light. It also makes them and more costly for them to play pots against you in position. So his 3-bet his is Higher than normal in the big blind, right? But well, higher than it's. It's not, you know, really, really tight. But it's still not out of control. That's true. But he's been three betting, uh, especially me, a lot, and also in other sessions. So I want to play back at him at one po at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, I the think way, he three bets probably, me. Yeah. The way the way so, I'd probably fight back at him is either playing a tighter game from the small blind or uh, four betting him with a wider range for value, not necessarily four bet bluff because if he's a thinking player at all, he's expecting you to uh, inevitably come back at him soon because, because he's re-raising you light. And as he does it here, you know, we get re-raised again and I would just fold here again um, because soon he's going to expect you to, to make a bluff on him because you think that he's he just doesn't have a big hand and mm. you know in reality you should just add anticipate that and, and get in there with a big hand all right okay so here's a raise and a free bet in front of me and it's a really big free bet um, which makes me a bit more inclined to four bet here yeah I would I would four bet ace cam I mean there's there's no hand that that uh, no game in, in this day and age that I wouldn't be cold for betting Ace King. <laughs> uh, what size do you think we should make it here? Um, I would make it... I'd make it like 100. Isn't that a bit strange because I'm overcommitting myself here and not shoving? No, I think it's fine. I, I think it, because it, it's, it's, a ba it's balanced because, you know... You could conceivably bluff that size. I mean, you're obviously pot committed. Um, as we have a hand on the top left, what's does this guy have? A, he's got yeah. a. Yeah, I'm. Go I I want to call here. Um, you could you could call. I'm I'm fine with calling. We'll get our. It might be a little tricky. I mean, this flop is really easy to play. Uh, just check raise all in. Um, there's also an argument to be made for just four betting and pre flop, with a hand like mm -hmm. that. And it's sort of the situation that we were talking about. If if happened, is that Mr. T who three bet you? That's a different. That's a different player on the top left, right? Well, that's a different player. Yes, this is uh, this guy. Okay. So. I would check the turn again. 
And miss, yeah, miss it the uh, three bet me again here. <laughs> well, we can we'll still fold. Let's just stay stick to the plan of just getting in there with a tight range. We can three bet Como though with that hand on the bottom left. And I would likely check just check this down at this point. If he bet the turn, I might be inclined to check raise um, to move him off ace king or not ace king sorry ace queen which would be or ace jack which would be a reasonable hand to check back on the river it looks like he's value betting something so yeah i just want to fold i'm probably folding i think it's a value bet so. i'm not sure what he's value betting there what he decided not to value bet earlier but... right i mean he might have he probably threw at you light and might have flopped like a, a five with like ace five or something and decided mm -hmm. to bet the river he might have had pocket nines Played it very yeah, I mean, these games are definitely aggressive. There's a lot of three betting, which is yeah, that's true. But surprising. the problem here is um, for most people, at least, uh, micro gaming regulars are mostly pretty aggressive and also pretty competent pre flop, but they're not so good post flop. That's fine. And then, I mean, my plan, I, I would definitely stick to the plan of uh, just being in there in, in in three bet pots, being in there pretty tight. And uh, being aggressive and widening, widening your four bet, four bet uh, range preflop to c basically counterattack their their three betting. I'd be four betting wider um, than I might usually in a tighter game. But I would try to stay away from defending too loosely out of position to three bets in position. At the same time, I mean, you really don't want to be involved in spots where you're like defending five seven suited in position. I know like tons of guys on the, in these networks love to like just call any two suited mm -hmm. cards trying to flop a draw, but it's just not that profitable against competent players who are re raising. Um, you'd rather be in there with big cards and big hands. And against this Mr. T. Um... When I open the button and he uh, three bets from a small blind, what range would, uh, would you four bet there? Um, With the history we got here, what range would I four bet? Uh, yeah. I would probably, hmm, probably at this point, ace jack and any pocket pair, and some of the pocket pairs I would just shove over the top of the three bet. But uh, you know, as far as, far as pure value. I'd probably I'd probably go with Ace Jack suited at this point and like sevens and better, okay. and adjust based on what he ends up turning up with. So I mean, this is a pretty clear spot. I would I'd bet and I'd bet you know, that's a really good size. And I I probably would not bet if I missed if I had Ace King in this spot because against a reasonably tight players defending range uh this is usually going to hit them all right but with ace king uh because it's a flop they hit but it's not a flop they hit so hard that i will be with my queens most of the time i think right i mean you could argue to say that well he doesn't re if he doesn't really hit it that hard why not bet with ace king and then try to bluff him on the turn it's because a board like that, if you do get called on, it becomes a uh, pretty difficult spot to figure out exactly what it is your opponent has. You know he's got this range of hands that somehow connected with this board. It could be a gut shot. It could be top pair, good kicker. It could be mid pair with some three to straight draw. And there are a lot of bad cards for the for your hand as a bluff versus that range on the turn. Um, what do you think uh, about set mining here? He's pretty tight and. We are a bit deeper. I think it can still be done out of positions. Yeah, there. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in the camp where I like calling instead of uh, re-raising with small pocket pairs out of the blind against tight players on the button, just because uh, there's so much value in hitting sets. Yeah, it's still a lot of people uh, say to fold to these hands pre-flop. Well, and I, I, I like to call them most of the time. Uh, when it's just a normal uh, three or four x bet, if it gets bigger or there's a free bet or something, I would just fold. Right. Uh, well, the pro the thing, the reason people say that is in theory because like exactly what's happening right here, 
um, because you can't offset the times that you miss the flop by check raising or checking it down and hoping to win post flop. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he had a hand like Ace Jack there. He's not c betting 100 percent of the time, and if, even if he is, he's improving by the river very often, in which case it makes your you know your play uh, not profitable. And against against opponents who are good at bluffing and who have wider ranges and are able to check back and control the pot size with mid pair, uh, you're just not going to be able to offset that out of position that advantage the disadvantage that you have out of position by um, by calling. So you have mm-hmm. Ace Jack here, he raised and you called preflop. Yeah. Um so what's your typical play on this spot? Um on a board like this I think I like raising. I think I can represent a lot of hands that want to get it in, so Well then my problem is my problem is this. He's only his C bet is only fifty two percent, right? Uh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean he's not C betting hundred percent of the time. If he was then I would raise. He's also pretty tight. On a board like this, um I just don't necessarily I I think if he didn't hit the flop or up some piece of it, he would just be check folding. Um mm-hmm. so I'm probably just folding here. Okay. Um his turn C bet is only twenty percent, so is there any chance we can call and uh try to take it down on a turn? No, because if we look at his range, just for, let's just say that like I'm correct about what his range for the flop C bet is. It's something that hit the flop, um, in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't have to be crushing the flop, but so you're not necessarily worried about getting bet three bet all in if you raise. But uh, a hand that hit some piece. So if he does, just because he's not C betting the turn uh, very often, it doesn't mean that he's not check calling. You know, so when you do call, yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay, yeah. So we need him to check fold the turn, and right. he probably doesn't. Okay. Uh, with the queens here, oh, this is funny. Okay, so I got a free bet, and I got a cold four bet all in. From a pre flop, um, I zero. think I'm just gonna shove. But I would still shove, yeah. Um, the is only, there any the only good really, thing about calling? The only real problem with this is that if you look at K Jeller up, his mm-hmm. uh, he's really really tight. And then you've got the other guy who's uh, pretty tight as well. Mm-hmm. So you might you might actually be in trouble. But the the problem is if if the roles were reversed, I'd be more likely to. I mean, you had the worst hand out of all three of them, which is funny. <laughs> yeah. Ace and kings. If Jeller up was the one who called four bet, I would muck in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, and queens is like with jacks with jacks I'd fold. When it got back to me, but Queens is definitely like the against these two particular players, I'd begrudgingly get it in and not be happy. Uh, it may actually be a mistake, but I would need a lot more hands than 141 and 43 to be able to tell. Yeah. Also, this the dark guy is short stack, so he can spaz with a lot of hands. Right. He might just have like pocket tens and say, you know. Yeah. So, so I'm only really worried about the killer up here. Right. And I mean, you you make Keller up a little bit looser, just even a little bit, then it becomes you know okay, easy, easy all in. But just the fact. Yeah, and and if we uh, see that the sample is only 140 hands, and we see his free bet was around two and a half, then we should uh, consider that after that it would be doubled. So. Right. As it is, so it's 4.9 right. now, and against the 4.9 range, we want to get it in. So. Right. So what well, <clears throat> what's the difference uh with these games compared to your uh, one two experience from the time you were playing one two? Um the time the time I was playing one two it was it was much, much easier because I was the only person three betting people. And <laughs> when I was the only person three betting people, when people started to three bet me, 
they were always bluffing because they were just pissed off that I was three betting them. Uh, so it, it was just very, very easy to play. You wouldn't have like the situation that we had with, like for instance, Como Como fifty four in that king's hand where he checked raises the ace turn small. Um, you know, there was never any check raising unless it was, you know, a bluff or a set. There's never any like uh, thin value betting. It's just very, very easy to to read hands and play, and you could play extremely loose pre flop because you could bluff your way out of any pot pot post flop if you saw the opportunity. It was very easy to put people on hands, and if you know you had that top pair hand by the same notion, you know no one's ever folding, and you know the people who are never folding, and there were tons of players at every single table with the bright glowing green. Uh, <laughs> Green numbers, yeah. and you didn't you didn't even have to game select. You could just open any table. Um, so it's just it was it was a great spot, and like you know, there there weren't you know resources like Deuces Cracked, like Card Runners, like all these training sites. Um, there was just two plus two, and you know you it was sort of uh, this secret little thing among two plus two. People would say sup pro to each other in the chat to find out if people were. Two plus two posters. And there was a lot of secrecy around nice. what, what what people's screen names were. You know, there was no data mining. It was just like it's a very good time to know what you were doing, or at least. And I didn't I didn't know what I was doing to the extent I do now. I wasn't able to to vocalize my thought processes that well, but I knew what I was doing was working, uh, and that was that was enough. I had my own little game plan. Okay. Sounds like a great time to play poker. Yeah, it was, was uh, back back in the party poker days. Yep, yep. I was in uh, I was in college and I was making nice money and it was sort of you know if I had known that the games would would get so difficult, uh, I don't mind floating here, especially because you see bets 100 percent. You've got over cards. I think it's a good spot to float. Um, uh, did you see the ace eight hand here that I just played against him? Yeah, what what did he have? He had Ace King. Okay. Um, I want to take a step here. Yeah, I would bet the turn. Birdie. Um, yep, he may fold Ace High, which is great for you. And if he doesn't, you have outs against anything. Um, mm -hmm. If you do happen to get check raised on the turn, uh, we'll see what the size is. Okay, so he checks. Oh, he calls, and I'm I'm a bit confused about his hand now. It might be some pocket pair. I would expect it to be a pocket pair or a jack, almost always. So I'd probably check back. I don't really expect him to fold, and it's interesting because he only he's twenty eight ten and he raised three six suited. I don't expect him to fold out on the river. So, so with the ace queen here, I called uh, the button raise from Keller up. Right. Uh, he's been be being a bit looser because he uh, I saw him raise on the. Uh, Bottom right table also at the same time. Right. Okay. Um, uh, I would just, even though it is Keller up and he's pretty loose, I'd still check raise this flop because you stand to be ahead of his of his range and like if you do like call twenty six. Twenty six is good. If you do call, he's he's not the kind of player who I would expect to try to barrel you off a nine or uh, you know value bet worse. So I'd rather just get more money in when my hand is ahead of his range. You know, against certain other players, calling might be a better line if you know that they're very aggressive with double barrels. Check raising might be better against the players who uh, just won't believe you when you check raise an ace high flop. Uh, that's sort of the uh, the really preferred bluff line by a lot of like aggro players who don't know how to read hands, um, but who are, who realize that you're continue betting a lot. They'll uh, they'll just check raise you on an ace high board because they think that you can't have an ace that often. And, you know, people who, who realize that are very reticent to fold on those boards. So uh, when you check raise, you know, that's that's something that you could take advantage of. All right. Here I decided to fold against a short stack. He's a, he had a pretty high fold to see bet, So I felt like I could see bet there. And when he shoved, I didn't get great odds. I think I get... Mm, almost one against two or something, but still I don't want to call there with one overcard only. Mm -hmm. That's fine. 
Uh, here's a great here's a great flop uh, against this guy because now we have top pair and he doesn't fold the C bets a lot, so we want to bet, uh, of course. But now uh, on almost any turn, I'm prone to check against him because you say he could be floating. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that you also just want to consider though is what his cold calling range is in position pre-flop. Um, how many? What kinds of hands is it? Is it a pocket pair? Are are there pocket pairs? Of course there are. But like, is he calling with ASEX suited? Is he calling with uh, suited connectors? What make up his preflop range? And even if you can't define it that uh, perfectly, just sort of pay attention to what you see this guy show up with. Make notes on him. Like I'll always pay attention if a guy, if if I like raise ace jack and value town myself on ace high flop against ace queen or ace king. I'll make a note, didn't re-raise ace-queen or ace-king in position. Now, that doesn't mean that he's, when he does re-raise, he can't have those in his range. It just means that uh, this guy knows how to slow play pre-flop, so I should be a little bit more careful with my thin value bets post-flop. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, just so I'm not as surprised. And also so I don't run some ill-timed bluffs when I think his range is uh, weaker than it might, it might be. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think you know the best the best players these days in, in the six mac games are, are are different from the best players. And when I was when I was playing primarily six max because they're the players now who are like going the extra effort. They're taking the extra effort to like dead of mind to table select to make notes. Um, and just pick their spots and don't get too out of line and not work on their tilt, uh, you know, not tilt away money. And those are going to be the big winners rather than the people who just have figured out the way to to pound on every single player. I mean, you you now it's it's taking even even though those players are obviously going to be the most talented, the biggest winners are going to be the ones who display those like extra extra abilities, the people who are like really um, focused on studying and improving, mm -hmm. yeah. doing a lot of EV calculations on different lines. Yeah, of course, there's so much to learn now that if you are really wanting to learn, you can become really good and even better than a more talented guy that just tries to figure it all out, in, uh, out on, his, on himself. Uh. So. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like I, I jumped into the other day. I had some money in stars, and I re rarely play in there anymore. But I jumped into the, into the twenty five fifty games. And there were a ton of players that I didn't even know. So immediately, I was just like being very cautious. But I also at the same time, I just assumed that they were just like you know, bad tags. And all of a sudden, I was facing these lots of three bets, like tons of three bets, and also lots of four bets and and lots of over bets, which you know. Generally, I, I wasn't seeing 2550 games. Uh, at least, don't see that much in 2550 games on full tilt. Especially, it's, it's especially difficult against players I don't even know. And um, you know, all of a sudden, it's a lot, uh, a lot tougher for me. I have to use my brain a lot more. And you know, if I want an eight table, I better pay close attention to the people I'm playing with and and play really tight for a while before I start to try to exploit any of their weaknesses because I don't know what they are. And they mm -hmm. know, they probably have a good idea of, of what what and how I think about poker. These are just considerations you didn't have to worry about a long time ago, but now the game is is changing and it's just it takes it takes a little, like you said, it takes a lot more work to get to the top, but you have a lot more resources available now. No limit is just playing being played at such a high level. It's yeah. A good, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Um there's a lot of money to be to be made if you want to make a living at it. Which is the good thing. So nowadays, uh, you said you normally play on full tilt, and you go to stars, and then the games play a bit differently. Yeah, they but play what, what, what they games play. are tougher? I mean, with people being creative and overbetting and stuff like that, or are the Full tilt game stuffer. Well, it's just it's just like a different player pool, or at least I think I think my, the, the most difficulty. And what is this guy's tab? As we as we look at this, this guy's like 
relatively tight. Um, he, he's the kind of player I'd shove the river against. Yeah, the house thing, I think the same thing. Uh, would I shove myself or just bet him all in or? Uh, just shove yourself. It's fine. Um, and I, I'd probably shove with uh, a bit more often with my bluffs than I am with my value betting hands. My value betting hands, I might bet like fifty or something mm-hmm. just to get called more often. But he's the kind of guy who could very easily have a stubborn ten or a pair with a flush draw there. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, just have yeah, to get, get him off that. He's not gonna fold a turn, so. Against a loser player, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bluff. I would only value bet the river because they're just not. They know their hands face up, and they know the ace is a good bluff card. Uh, you, there is something to be said for making, for bluffing sometimes to make their. You know, you need to bluff sometimes, not none of the time, to make their the times that they call unprofitable. Mm-hmm. Um, unless they're obviously. Uh, and also to make your double barrel bluffs profitable as part of a larger game plan, but your range should definitely be weighted away from equal parts bluff and equal parts value betting. Um, whereas your turn bar- barrel range could be equal parts. Just your triple barrel range has to be uh, slightly skewed uh, right. against looser, against looser players. But uh, yeah, back to your question. I mean, I think I think the difficulty for me ranges. It, it's more stems from not knowing the players and on full tilt i know the players a lot better so i know how they play um on stars i was just surprised i mean i'm sure there are players that only play on stars and i was surprised by how good some of them were uh but yeah the the six max games are just a lot tougher like i used to think i was probably uh one of the top six max players and now like there definitely been people who have uh gotten to be as good as i am or even better than me without even me knowing about them just because I don't play them day in and day out. Okay. Uh, here, this flop, I think uh, he missed a lot, and I got, of course, a gut shot. So, right, I'll that's check fine. raising. Uh, with so nines, blind, blind versus blind. I want a free bet here. Go for it. Uh, just for value, like you said before, people can go out of line, blind versus blind. So. Mm-hmm. And against somebody I don't really have history with, I'd probably do nines and ace queen. Plus, that would be my three betting range at the start. And as I start to realize that they might be getting out of line, I'll make that a little bit wider. Maybe sevens, maybe eights, maybe ace jack suited. Um, the more passive they are to three bets, the more I'll include like just random hands that ha- that are just you know complete trash. Some just like jack four off if I think it's a good spot or obviously 7-8 suited against the people who are calling and you know you want to have some disguise value when you are three betting um those are just some some things to just keep in mind in those particular situations how passive how aggressive the players are but i think a good value range to start off would be like nines plus and ace queen plus Uh, um i want to get back on the shelf uh, against this guy on the table three Mm -hmm. um do you think it makes a difference that he buys in short and that I don't know him as a regular so he might be uh, scared to lose an entire stack so he can't play anymore yeah that's possibly that, that's definitely uh, something that I would I would be thinking about I wouldn't try to make it uh, have too much bearing on my decision because he could also just be uh, somebody who doesn't like care about the money or somebody who uh, you know, it's just it's just a short stack who who doesn't know what he's doing and will just call it off anyway. But uh, the tighter they are, though, as far as being a short stack, I'll definitely agree that the more often they are to, or the more bearing it is that they they have that short stack and they they're afraid to lose it all. Definitely. Okay. At the same time, they could be. Some people will might look at that pot and be like. Oh God, the pot's so big, and that was all. That was all. That money was just in my stack. I need to call because I need a chance to win it. So yeah, yeah, they think they are committed. So yeah, oh, cool. All I mean, right. play like a another orb or so and wrap up here. But I mean, what do you think? What do you? How do you think these games compare? I mean, you play you play what two, four, and three, six primarily, right? No, I play uh, one, two, and one and a half, three mostly. Oh, okay. Okay. And I will take some shots at two, four sometimes, but I have to How? play there a lot. So uh, what's on, your... on this side, I don't really see a difference between two, four, and one, two. Also, because it's 
a lot of the same players. Uh, it's not entirely true. There are uh, a bit better post-flop players at 2-4. Right. But pre-flop, it's almost the same because it's pretty aggressive here also. Yeah, I'm definitely surprised at how aggro preflop is. I mean, what, so what, what's your plan? Are you are you content playing like a tons of tables of one two, or do you want to move up to two four eventually? Um, so far, I just play uh, a lot of one two tables. If I play six max, I've started playing heads up. Gotcha. How do you like uh, heads up? Uh, I really like it. Yeah, you get the fish for yourself. So. Yeah, heads up is fun. You can. You can take a you know like a 2014 tight player, put him in a heads up situation, and get him to do all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, that's, which is that's, it's fun. That's funny so far, um, but so far, yeah, if I play six max, I mainly just play a lot of one two tables. I do want to move up, uh, not just to uh, two four. I want to get higher eventually, but I need to uh, save some money to move to Dublin. So. Oh, cool. I will move up now. Gotcha. Well, I mean, you play you play pretty pretty well and think about things pretty well, so I have faith you'll get there. And this All guy right, could so, gel her up. Yeah. And I just, I'd fold. You can't really do much about that unfortunate situation. Mm -hmm. that, uh, if he if he realizes his image, he could squeeze there profitably with any two cards, and you're just forced to fold. There's not much you can do. Yeah. But still, yeah, he's been pretty, pretty tight, so, uh, I mean, just I just give him that hand, and I will hopefully take down a stack another time. Yep. Uh, so let's wrap this up. I'm only playing one table now, so. Yeah. All right, well, you know, this has been Krantz and the Loon with Deuces Cracked for Mentor, and uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask either of us in the in the thread that's posted when this video goes up. Alright guys. See you later.